For me, it's about setting those feedback loops, those cycles of being able to listen to what your employees are saying, getting your customers involved, and all about community building. You mentioned it. It's about, you know, it is one community for the fantastic organizations up, up alongside here. You know, you listening to that community and getting that feedback and incorporating that into, into what you're doing and, and employees then feel empowered. Okay, so uh, let's move on to, um, given all of your chosen missions for your companies, right? A lot of you will have, um, uh, Tessa, you said, you know, you've got a partner, you are very like-minded, slightly different experiences. You know, Elliot, I think you mentioned that your wife is your co-founder, you know, so, so, you know, you probably got people who joined you on this journey who were really enthusiastic, right? And that's, that's absolutely great, yeah? Um, but but um, I think one of the things is, is that how do you get, uh, how do you get other people to get involved, how do you get? How do you get uh, maybe employees in your company? So a lot of these guys here, they might have some good aspirations about how they can do things in their company, and we'll talk about maybe how existing technology could be turned to to be better. Um, but but how do they actually take take other people, maybe their customers, for example, or their or their partners or their community on that journey, to uh, to be convinced of the mission that you think is good? Um, I'm going to come to Tessa first on that. Thanks, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Behaviour change, how do you make it happen? Um, it's really hard, actually, to, to take people with you on that journey, but I actually think it's got a lot easier uh, in the past 12 to 18 months. So something has happened. I think the pandemic played a really significant role. There has been a step change in people's mentality and openness and willingness to engage with the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the resource depletion crisis, the inequality crisis, all these sort of multiple crises that all feed into each other. I sense that we are collectively waking up to these and each and every one of us is thinking, how can I play a part? And so what we've all now got to do as business leaders is make it really easy for people to take that first step. And you have to position it as a baby step, not a massive, enormous commitment, but just something really small, really simple that you can do starting today or tomorrow. And then once people get on that journey, they get that feedback loop of realizing how great this feels, it then becomes a virtuous um, cycle. And one thing, um, it would be remiss of me to miss this opportunity for a shameless plug, on this, um, but I uh, was recently invited to join the government task force um, for Tech Zero, um, and that was kind of set up by, um, being led by Hayden Wood from Bulb, and essentially uh, we are inviting tech businesses to join us and to make a, a pledge and a commitment to uh, measure their carbon emissions and then to set an ambitious target please do uh, Google Tech Zero, um, and you can find out a bit more information about the pledge there. Most importantly, though, there's a toolkit which helps you sort of take those first steps um, on this journey. And then the final point I would make when you're trying to go on a journey either with customers um, or with employees or partners is to be really, really honest and transparent about the fact that you are not perfect. This is going to be a journey. It's going to be a long journey. Uh, and if you take people along on that journey, on that journey with you, then you will hopefully avoid the biggest pitfall of all, which is greenwashing, which needs to be avoided at all costs. You, you want to define greenwashing for those? I mean, greenwashing is taking some small little initiative, you know, and actually it's greenwashing, it could be social equality washing, you know, all of these things. It's like taking some small little initiative in some tiny part of your organisation and blowing it up front and centre PR-wise and using the sort of halo of goodness um, to imply that you're a wonderful organisation. Um, and I just think that really people are getting very cynical um, to that and they're increasingly getting bombarded by these sort of I'm great messages and people react far better to honesty, which is we're making progress, we've got these really big problem areas, but we're determined to fix them. Okay, that's great. I think also your employees... We've got a lot of young employees in Naked One. They hold you to account. You, you, you just can't work your way around that kind of stuff. They ask you those difficult questions all yeah. the time. And I think that's a really valid point. If you don't start taking action, you will not be able to attract and retain talent. Yeah. Simple. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one for all of us out there, right? If, if, you know, our employees are looking for reasons. You know, remote working. Oh, I don't want to work in an office now. I want to work remote. 
whether the, the company's looking at sustainability, whether they've got a green agenda, all of that stuff plays into that. Um, Chris? I was going to say, could I grab yeah, the mic? Because sure. I, I really like what you said about that sort of small incremental changes or opportunities for people to get involved. Um, I think we've all gone through, as you say, sort of like the last 18 months, this a societal self-actualization aspiration. Like, like we're all we're all seeing work as something. Not all, but we're you know there's a lot of like recognition. Like we're not part of a machine anymore. The sort of Taylorist hundred years, like I'm a you know a unit of like production. So so I think is that a you know that that's what gives me a lot of um, a lot of confidence in like the change that might come. I think like people are starting to wake up that. What is my role in the business? What my they're getting an agency, a voice when you talk about employees. So you just yeah, for me it's about setting those feedback loops, those cycles of being able to listen to what your employees are saying, getting your customers involved, and all about community building. You mentioned it. It's about you know it is one community for the fantastic organisations alongside here. You know you listening to that community and getting that feedback and incorporating that into into what you're doing and and employees then feel empowered they feel empowered to make the change you give them that freedom and that space and, and they'll take it and grab it so um yeah i'd really echo a lot of the points i think that tessa made there and i think the other thing is is that often our employees these days we're looking for much more diversity and that reflects our consumers or our community stakeholders a lot and so we can listen to what our employees are guiding us to a little bit because that will be representative of the, of the community at large um, Elliot, what about, what about you in this area? What, what, what's your uh, really interesting on the kind of the baby steps thing, and it, it totally is that. And it's also, has a great definition of greenwashing, and write that down. Um, it, it it's, to, it's, to allow, <laughs> it's to allow businesses to, to change course, you know, and, and to support those businesses that haven't historically been there, that haven't necessarily been like the world's most ethical, but to support those that are trying to make the changes as well. So it's a, it is a fine line with greenwashing. It's really interesting. I think um, but when it comes to behavior change, I think when it comes to doing good, it is you know, kind of subtly addictive. So those baby steps are really important. You know, for example, uh, we have subscribers who offset their own carbon footprint as an individual, and then they chat to their, chat to their uh, business about, you know, well, maybe there's something here, and you know, that it kind of is like a little pinball mechanism, and it starts to happen, and then the business realize, oh, hey, if we, if we did more good, then, you know, there's kind of like another little angle we can tune into with uh, gamification. You know, what used to be thought of as like dark UX or dark arts where you get people to normally spend more money. This is like a, a win-win thing that we get to gain here that, you know, kind of a, a race to the top of our leaderboards for businesses that are trying to change as fast as possible and undoing loads of history. So, you know, we really love that kind of, you know, kind of gamification thing, like what can make you feel better and better about what you're doing and no company CEO or someone who's managing a P&L wants to spend a lot of money on something good but then only to have like a, a PDF to show for it at the end of it. Um, they need to be able to point to where they've spent the 10 grand or a million pounds or whatever on the internet and so uh, we realise this is what companies need. They, they, they just need that value exchange. And so we did quite a lot with kind of having a public impact profile for a business. So it's a place, it's a place on the internet you get to kind of round up the kind of the, the good things that are happening. But through honesty and making sure the old greenwash, uh, greenwash doesn't uh, turn up. But that's, that's not our stick. You know, any business should have the opportunity to, you know, be uh, relevant in the world that we're moving into. If your business isn't already thinking about it, you just, you know, it, need, it needs to be core, at core of what you're going to be doing because soon there's, you know, not, I mean, not many businesses that are able to thrive in this kind of climate era that we're, that we're coming into. I mean, that, that, that sounds great. I, I, I can now see all these CEOs doing the whole my forest is bigger than your forest game. <laughs> yeah. thing, right? And that, that might be greenwashing a little bit, yeah. right? But, you know, if it, if it gets the numbers up and gets yeah. people yeah. engaged, it's a, win -win thing. It's, yeah. a, it's a great tool. Yeah. I, I like the idea that you're game, gamifying a social enterprise. I mean, that's just, mm. that just plays into the whole endorphins world and getting everybody going. So yeah. that's good. Alex, what about you in this, in this space? Yeah, so I guess... How do you get people to follow you? That's really the question, isn't it? Um, I mean, you're all leaders, right? You, you, I assume everyone in this room has multiple direct reports. And how do you get your direct reports to follow you? And my guess is that you want your direct reports to, to feel good. 
about following you and to feel good in general. And the sort of leader and manager who dresses people down and makes their direct reports feel shitty and guilty and inadequate is probably not going to be managing that person for, for too long because that person will, will, will be off or will underperform. And I think that's just the approach that a business needs to take. You need to accept the fact that uh, we can all sit around and we can you know, make people feel shit about themselves and what they're doing, but that's not a very good way of, of getting them to follow you. And I think one of the big differences between Beam and you know, other organizations who are working in homelessness is that we are about positivity. I mean, our name is Beam because of the connotations of Beam and beaming a smile and light and all of these positive things, which is not to say that it's not a sad and tragic situation that there are 330,000 homeless people in the UK, 120,000 homeless children living in emergency accommodation. Of course, that's terrible. Of course, you want to fix that. But making people feel bad and guilty is, I don't think, the way to fix that. And so, you know, I think that economic ecology is a great example of that. It's like, yes, we don't want people to buy as much, but people are going to buy stuff. And telling people to not buy stuff is not a very good way to get people on side. But if people are going to buy stuff, then let's make sure that we can put in all of the incentives and all of the user experience and all the other things to make sure that that's having as positive an impact as possible. So that's the kind of user experience that we also try and create at Beam. Helping people should be joyful, OK? It should be joyful because it's an inherently joyful thing. I'd argue it's one of the most joyful things that any of us in this room can do. But it doesn't always feel like that. So we needed to create a joyful user experience, and that is hopefully what, what we're building. And the way it works is people, uh, whether they're businesses or, or individuals using the Beam platform, they'll get an email each month introducing them to the person that they're helping, sharing the story of the person they're helping, and they will see this individual progress. And it will feel joyful because it is joyful to do very, very little and to see someone's life changing in front of your eyes. And people give you know, all kinds of sums each month. Lots of people just give fiver or a tenner. But I guarantee you that that fiver brings more joy into their life than a pint. I absolutely guarantee you. And so that's the way I think that we create change. Um, it's through joy. It's through making people feel good. We do absolutely no marketing, and we've done now about 80,000 donations through the platform. And it's just word of mouth. People tell their friends, and also people don't churn because it feels good. All of our churn is to do with people changing debit card and credit card. It's almost never because people want to end their monthly subscription. So um, I think you know that that's how we at least try to do it. It's, it's yeah, through joy and positivity. I, I think that's good. I think you make a really valid point about you know how you how you inspire your team. Yeah, and I think I think some of the stuff that we as leaders can take away from this panel is that you know they've got important missions which don't always necessarily have a profit line behind them, and so you know you can't point at the money and say oh we're making lots of money. So you have to find a way of getting people on that on that mission. And you know, I think I think the, the giving money thing and making somebody's a difference in somebody's life in a helpful way, I mean that's like helping an old lady across the street, right? It makes you feel good every time you do it.